Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Growth Leap. I'm your host, Michel Gagnon. We talk to pretty awesome business builders who are designing disruptive and meaningful companies. We have a very special guest today who's made it his mission to reduce online misinformation and abusive content from the internet. Dhruv Gulati is co-founder and CEO of Fakmata, a London-based tech startup who uses unique algorithms to score and classify content. Since 2017, he's raised 3.5 million from the likes of Mark Cuban, owner of the NBA's Dallas Mavericks, but also from the founders of Zynga, Brightmail, Twitter, and Craigslist, to name a few. Drew has a really exciting and interesting experience. We talk about how he went from investment banking to launching his own company. We talk about traction, fundraising, and obviously we cover some of the mistakes he's made along the way. Hope you enjoy. Drew, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure having you with us. I've been following Fact Matter for a while now, and I'm really excited to have you on the show. I like the mission. You believe that addressing online misinformation is our collective social responsibility. I got two kids. I could not agree more. Let's start with the basics. Can you tell us a bit about what's Fact Matter today? What, what kind of products do you offer and to whom? Yeah, sure. So we kind of split the business into B2B and B2C. Broadly, B2C offering is is about trying to derive training data to improve the B2B offering. That's our strategy. So our B2B offering right now, the core offering is a media monitoring system that's able to track narratives that are spreading online. So unlike existing media monitoring tools that essentially use keywords and track mentions of a company or a brand, we are able to go in and actually track claims and opinions and thus narratives that slowly start to emerge and evolve and spread online across different platforms. That is the core B2B proposition. And you offer that to brands specifically? So we offer that to brands, we offer that to corporates, we offer that to risk management consultancies, PR agencies, and that's where where um, we're seeing a lot of interest. Uh, Great. In it. And it's a uh, software as a service model? It's a SaaS model, yes. Okay, great. I'd like to go back a bit to the beginning because you, I mean, you just have, it's just a great story. If I'm not mistaken, you have a master's in computer science, uh, BA at London School of Economics. You followed a quite interesting path from investment banking to product development, biz dev, uh, entrepreneur in residence. Can you tell us what brought you to where you are today? What's the story behind founding uh, Factmata? Sure. Yeah. So as you kind of pointed out, you know, my, my journey into the tech world has been quite circuitous. You know, I started off doing absolutely no tech, um, working in a bank, working on financing solutions for hedge funds, you know, completely, completely different. And I was always interested in getting into the tech world and always had some side projects and, and ideas that I was playing around with, uh, with, with friends. The first startup that I joined straight out of banking was a web scraping startup called Import.io. Mm -hmm. And I got a job there as a product person, uh, which is unusual because most people get jobs uh, you know, straight out of banking as operations people or, or BD people. And this startup, Import.io, was my, my task was basically to build data products. So mm -hmm. APIs, essentially, that we sold to business customers that could, where they could see the value of scraped data uh, and the value of web data uh, produced at scale um, in a structured format. So I, I got a lot of experience for a year or so in, in what it takes to actually deal with huge amounts of data and what it is to deal with and, and manage engineers who deal with kind of, you know, information at scale. And after that, you know, joined a small startup that got into tech stars uh, and I was a product person there called Weave AI that was working on contextual search. We were trying to build a contextual search engine that would essentially search across all the apps on your mobile phone and allow you to deep link into each one of them. And then, as you say, I, I basically realized that I was being a product person in all these deep tech companies, but really didn't have any technical experience. So I, I, I got an offer um, at UCL, University College London, to, to do a computer science master's. And I joined that course, sort of took a break in my career. And I was always interested in 
you know, I was doing a computer science degree, but I was always interested in machine learning and, and, and AI. And specifically, language processing is was what really interested me. So I kind of hounded the people in the NLP lab at UCL, and I was thinking about what I would want to write as my thesis in the summer. And I had a bunch of different options, but I knew after doing the computer science degree, I wanted to launch a business. And I was thinking about business ideas. And, 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 and when I thought about business ideas, I didn't really think, you know, what would be a great business idea? I sort of thought about what do I care about spending the next five to 10 years of my life on and being an expert in? And to me, this idea of, of fact-checking politicians was what captivated me at that time. So could I effectively, during election seasons or, or really throughout the year, when a politician who's or someone in a position of power makes a statement about something, and then that's disseminated at scale across the internet, could I provide an automated system to effectively call them out and make sure that people aren't deluded when they see those those claims and i thought actually that's a that's an incredibly meaningful thing to work on because if you have good information in in the world and you feel like people that people make decisions based on good information and they are more rational when they think about things we would have a much better planet effectively mm -hmm. uh, and and you know we're seeing that play out obviously, you know, now, but going back to the, the story, I did this thesis basically on automated fact checking on statistical statements online. And I was with, with two professors. And then basically, on, I then got a stint at Entrepreneur First, which is the European sort of venture build, builder for a few months, and then got word that that Google, uh, as part of its digital news initiative had funded, um, you know, a proposal that we put out me and my two professors on an automated fact checking system. And that then led to me then going full time on the journey to kind of building this this company. Did you find at the beginning maybe a challenge? Uh, because you know we we really like at Stun and Up companies who are building something meaningful, not just another gimmick. And trust you know you you know it as much as I do that there's a lot of gimmicks out there. Have you struggled maybe at the beginning to find that balance between you know I'm, I want to make a dent in the universe, but I also need to you know pay the bills. You know, the, find yeah. that balance between the cause and uh, profitability. Absolutely. We, we've definitely faced those issues for sure. You know, I'm a first time founder. This is my first company. Uh, I made all the mistakes that most first time founders kind of make. I'd say definitely, you know, the, 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 when I thought of, like I said, you know, the, it wasn't even thought of as a business idea. The business idea had to come up off, you know, had to come afterwards yep. from this broader mission of, of bringing more truth to the world, which is a kind of noble mission, but but finding those beachheads where you start to make money has been a journey. And I think the other thing that I found is that particularly when raising your first check from investors, really people get captivated by the mission. And so, you know, I was able to raise capital basically on this this mission. You know, like here's here's what we're trying to do. If we achieve that mission and that vision, it would be an incredibly valuable business, um, mm -hmm. for sure. So on the basis of that future massive goal, we were able to raise the first capital. But I'd say after the first year or the first two years, or as time goes on, you get that pressure of, of okay, well, you know, the company's raised this much money. When's the money going to start coming in? I think another challenge for me has been trying to deal with you know, what I see is sometimes some short termism amongst the investor community, because I think if you were to say, okay, you know, here's a, here's a business that's trying to achieve that vision, how long would it really take to get to market? And I think my challenge was actually convincing investors that this is going to take time and let's focus on the product and let's keep building and let's keep building the actual core, core AI that's needed for this. And then in a few years, you will see this, the returns coming in. But being able to kind of hold back on trying to get instant gratification revenue for something when the underlying AI is not built properly or finished, I think is arguably really, really damaging. And I think that that's something that I'm, I'm now getting more and more passionate about personally, that particularly in the AI world, we have this discussion around ethical AI. We have this discussion around explainable AI. These things take time. You need to take extra time building the AI, which is already hard to build. 
yep. to actually achieve ethical AI. So if investors really want that and the world wants that, you know, we need to be patient in, in building that into the technologies that we ship. A hot topic when you launch a, a business is getting traction and, and customer acquisition, right? And you are basically, with your technology, helping detect hyper-partisanship, hate speech, sexism, racism, you know, obscenity, clickbait, these kind of things. We're in the middle of a presidential election in, in yeah. the U.S. There are people, I think more uh, today more than, than ever, who are benefiting from that misinformation whether it's uh, politicians but also you know websites who are making money out of out of crap yeah. um when you started focusing really on customer acquisition what kind of in that um context what kind of of strategy have you uh, put in place yeah so our i think our customer acquisition has been in a sense quite unique because even just like investors and and people around the world get captivated when you tell them that you know you're, you you have a system that's able to detect propaganda or a system that's able to detect fake news given the media cycle around this it just cold direct outreach on linkedin or running campaigns uh, on email has been incredibly effective you know our response rates are you know close to 80% wow which is which is fantastic i think the real thing for us has been you know, what is the right time we actually go to the right types of people? So, and that's been a learning in terms of, you know, some customers really need the product to be incredibly robust and working and able to be plugged in immediately. And those people we should, probably shouldn't have gone for in the first year. Mm -hmm. The people we should have gone for in the first year, which should have been our champions who, you know, got how hard it is to build the technology and would be willing to work with us to provide us with training data, give us feedback on the models, perhaps kind of give up some scalability on the API in return for better accuracy in the models that we're, we're shipping, things like this. But I'd say the direct approach has been pretty great. The other thing is, you know, getting media attention. Obviously, we raised investments from some great investors and, and that that kind of helped with the, the you know, giving some, some credibility. And then having the credibility also of the NLP research community to the professors that, that you know, are scientific advisors in the company and, and I launched the business with. Um, one of them now is, is a core part of Facebook AI research in Europe, Dr. Sebastian Riedel. And Dr. Andre Andreas Vlachos is now leading the automated fact-checking lab at University of Cambridge and are both very well respected in the NLP community. So giving, you know, getting that was also giving us credibility to, um, that, that we sort of understood the, the background of what would be needed to actually make these algorithms effective. So basically what you're saying is that you may at the beginning have gone for, for some of the big fish out there. And with hindsight, you would have said, maybe we should have, you know, looked for smaller players uh, to get started, to test the product and to get, you know, maybe traction a, a bit faster. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we first went out to market, we basically went for the big shot and we thought, hey, let's purely focus on building a platform and thus build the best models possible to detect propaganda, the best models possible to detect hate speech. We had five research interns working, iterating, you know, every three months we'd improve the models. Um, but then we were, we were then trying to sell this API into ad exchanges. And what I think we, we, we learned a bit too late was ad exchanges really need you to operate at massive scale mm -hmm. from the get go. They process, you know, hundreds of millions of impressions, you know, per day. And so we would go to them and say, hey, this is the best model ever. And this is the best algorithm. You guys need to kind of remove this from your networks, integrate the API. And they already had solutions that were hadn't even done any of this stuff. but could work at scale. And so, so they were sort of like, you know, come back later, you know, when you can work at that. Mm -hmm. So that was an, an, an interesting learning of, um, and obviously from a cost and, and resource allocation perspective, I was always adamant that we focus on the actual AI first and then focus on scale. But then when we were in that ad tech, you know, moment, we decided to allocate some engineers to kind of scaling it up. And, and in hindsight, you know, that's a classic mistake of, uh, that, that you should never scale when you actually have locked until you have locked revenues mm -hmm. and that customer can kind of work with you to to again you know scale it up slowly and gradually 
I want to talk about the mistakes that you've made, but before we need to talk about funding, uh, we cannot not talk about your elite investors. Again, you, you have just a, such a cool story. There's an amazing headline in a Business Insider story from 2017 that reads, a 25-year-old CEO emailed Mark Cuban to pitch his anti-fake news startup for investment, and it worked. And that you know CEO happens to be you. What is even more amazing is that it's not just uh, Mark Cuban. You also count uh, Mark Pincus, founder of Zynga, uh, Sunil Paul, founder of Brightmail, Biz Stone, co-founder of Twitter, Craig Newmark, founder of Craigslist. It's just, you know, it's just such a cool list. A lot of our listeners are looking for funding. A lot of them are struggling with raising funds. Can you tell us a bit about that story uh, and maybe share some advice with them on, on fundraising? Yeah, absolutely. So... You know, look, I'm a first time founder. I haven't sold three, four businesses before. You know, I kind of did a de degree in computer science, like, you know, and I work, used to work in banking and I'm sitting in London, which is a disadvantage when you're trying to raise from Silicon Valley. So I really had a lot of kind of stacked against me, I'd say. And, you know, when, when I had the idea, we didn't have any revenues. We really didn't have, we just had this mission basically, right? And we had a lot of documents and plans and slide decks of what it would take to build this out. What people don't know actually publicly is that that when I left Entrepreneur First and I and I got my funding from Google, you know, that was a small grant that was about 50,000 to kind of just basically build a browser extension and prove some things out. But when that money was running out, the 50K, I basically ran out of money myself. And I was faced with the prospect of trying to get a, you know, having to get a job or continue with the idea. And I had to take a loan actually personally of about 25 grand. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, and I just didn't have that money and I needed to. So basically I took that loan. It was from one of these loan providers online. And it, was, it was not a pawn I, shop or, or a... it wasn't a pawn shop. It wasn't a pawn <laughs> shop. It was, um, it was one of those, which is now Le actually legitimate a, one. I think it was one, you know, if you remember kind of Wonga and, and yeah. Zoba, these kind of guys. So it was one of those. I got rejected by two and then, and then uh, got one alone come in. And then I was basically like, look, I need to make this work. You know, I need to figure out within a month to pay that 25K back. And I basically just compiled a list of all the people who at this point, when we just didn't really have anything, we just had this vision and it, we had me and, you know, we had some good research backing the, the idea, you know, basically just, just compiled this massive list. And I think that, that, is, that is what I always do when I'm fundraising, which is to be very, very targeted with the exact type of people who would get the business, get the stage that it's at, be targeted at the sectors that they look at, and think about the things that they, they might actually be looking for. And you can learn a lot about people online. You, know, you can go in their Twitters and you can see what types of things they post about, You can, you can see what they're clearly interested in. You know, Mark Cuban is a political figure as well and, 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 you know, has shown some interest in, in, in the elections and, 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 you know, has been involved in the conversations around Trump. And, you know, obviously Craigslist, you know, business that arguably some people think actually caused a lot of this, the uncleanliness of the, of the internet because of the stuff that you can post on Craigslist. And mm -hmm. it's a very free flowing platform. So these types of people, I thought, Well, maybe they would get what I'm trying to do. Uh, and maybe they also have capital to give it a shot and without much, much diligence and, and, and actually just back the vision and the idea that we have. And then obviously further down the line, as you start to get more traction and you get to solidify the structure of the business, you start to get more structured invested in, in place who, who, whose entire job is to look at, you know, lots and lots of investments and, and, and go through a massive due diligence process and, and look at the financials and things like this. And then, over time, you'll be able to get those investors. But the, the advice that I give is really fundraising is about hustle. It's about just caring so much about the idea that you just don't want it to die. And I really do feel like, you know, the stories that we've had, many people would have probably just, just stopped. But I think being so wedded to what we're trying to do in the long run and having a 10-year vision, which we, which we have, allows us to get perspective on when things are not going so well or the traction's not that great. We just remind ourselves that are actually we're part of a long-term journey. And most businesses take seven to 10 years to actually get well-known. And a lot of investors, 
founders beat themselves up, investors beat founders up that they're not making, you know, a million dollars within six months. It's a long game. And, and so I, I kind of use those stories of, of, you know, the best companies always had these slow uh, starting points to then drive me forward. Mm -hmm. And what would you say helped you in, in your pitch? Because whenever you follow startups, accelerators, incubators, sometimes it feels like uh, they are teaching uh, founders to pitch uh, more than they're teaching them to uh, build and run a business. What helped you in your pitch? Was this, you know, the the way you set it up, the promise that you made, the the financials, you know, that you you put in there, or as you said earlier, was that you know you played more on the vision, and you know the the novel cause that we you were you know, you were fighting for? Did you mean in my initial pitch? Yeah, yeah. So in my initial pitch, I think it was really around you know obviously we did, did get some really aggressive questions around you know how's this going to make money. But all we could do at that point was to, to go through the bunch of experiments that we plan to to run and, and very clearly delineate how long each one's going to take. What are the risks of each experiment? What do we know? And, and, and set out a plan uh, on that basis. One of the challenges of my business is that it can be applicable across anything. You, know, you could sell it to ad networks. You could sell it to journalists who are writing up their uh, articles. You could sell it to PR firms. You could sell it to brands. You could sell it to governments. You could sell it to uh, intelligence agencies, regulators, lawyers. So going through all those experiments is the journey that we've taken in the last kind of two, three years to get product market fit. Mm -hmm. And being thorough around that and thinking about which one you prioritize first and having a really close learning loop is the key thing that I've, I've learned. You know, being able to cut things out after even five or six data points. Yeah. So the initial pitch was really, okay, you know, here's the problem. Here's a bunch of experiments that we're going to run to, to make our first revenues. Um, and here's the, here's the products that we're going to build uh, to be able to achieve those things. And the overall vision was always B2B, but always having a B2C component mm -hmm. that would allow us to scale the training data that we'd need to make the B2B proposition have a data moat and actually be really effective. Great. You mentioned that you have a 10 year vision and, you know, I've, I've looked at it, you know, you've, you've talked about it um, uh, publicly. You talked, you know, that you want to go from a minimum viable engine, B2B monetization to, you know, consumer platform and growth. We're in a fast moving tech world. One thing is is true one day, the other day there's a massive merger or massive, you know, new, there's GDPR coming in or, or you know, and other regulations. I'm interested in understanding why you came up with that 10-year vision. And it's it's relatively detailed. You know, you, you have these increment of these phases of three to four years. Um, yeah. I'm interested in just hearing about, you know, what's your thinking behind that where, You know, very frequently, you, as you said, we're we're focused on short term. Uh, VCs want their money, you know, pretty fast. What was the thinking behind that? I think the thinking behind the reason rationale behind doing that is that I think really good investors who get it and they've they've done internet businesses before, uh, particularly ex founders, it's good to have that written down because it keeps you in check. Like I said, knowing you know when things are hard or when your team, for example, you know, uh, joins the company and they want to know what does this company actually do? What, what does it stand for? And you want to actually bring in at the beginning of the company people who are in it for 10 years, potentially, which is also difficult, right, in today's climate around hiring. To give them that, that outline and have people see that publicly, I thought was a really important thing to do Trans for transparency, you know, transparency is one of the big tenets of the company. And so it's an element of kind of holding, having a vision that people in the company can, can look at, good investors could see uh, ahead, and also being able to, to, to tell ourselves like, okay, for example, it's year three of the business, we shouldn't be focusing on, you know, the next phase until this phase is finished. Or, um, hey, the revenues are you know, not where we want them to be. So we have another year to get it within that four-year mark of hitting break-even. Things like that add 
time pressure, um, and they also hold us accountable. And then sometimes they give us some slack as well that actually, you know, we should be, we, we've got some time. Let's keep building the product. And, and then when we launch, we can launch properly. Mm-hmm. You've talked about, you know, hitting the, the whatever revenue target. You have that cost. On one hand, uh, you have investors who are expecting a return. How do you actually measure success at Factmata? What kind of KPIs? Are we just, you, you, do you, you know, mainly focus on the financials, you know, the usual stuff that, you know, VCs would be looking for? Or do you have other KPIs that are, you know, mainly, maybe a bit closer to, you know, the vision that you're trying to achieve? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think one of the, one of the great quotes that I, I read recently was actually by Naval Ravikant on Twitter. And he mm-hmm. talks about, how we need to realize that ethical wealth creation is possible. I think that's the gist of the the tweet, basically. And so what that means is just because you make money uh, and you you know make revenues of the business and maybe you make you know billions of dollars of revenues, it doesn't mean that you have to be an unethical company. And so for us, I think the way that we measure it right now in the business is very heavily skewed towards revenue. But we also are very focused on things like the amount of data that we've gathered. So we, we, we try and measure, you know, if we're scanning for fake news online, a big part of what we're trying to achieve is scale. You know, how much coverage of the internet do we achieve? So the amount of URLs that go through our platform, uh, we also measure the accuracy of our models. Uh, we measure the amount of expert, the annotated training data that we've obtained, because that's ultimately part of the, the core value that we're creating is that we have expert annotated data that, that drives these models. It's not coming from anywhere. It takes time to, to actually accumulate. Yeah, so, so we do have, have technical KPIs beyond revenue that we know are important. But I'll give you an example of, of why, you know, for us, in a way, revenue is, 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 is actually part of our vision. So one, one of the things that, that I, I've seen in, in the social impact space, having, having got, been in it, I think it's kind of a unique journey. You know, like I said, I worked in a bank when I first started. So I've been in, in the full capitalist world and before you know, being in the social impact world. And you do meet a lot of different types of people. And there is sometimes this undertone of, you know, because you're a for profit, you're making money, you must be doing something unethical. And so there's a little bit of a kind of skepticism. But I know that, that for us to achieve our long term vision, we need to be able to cover our costs and be profitable as soon as possible and be self-sufficient. And so right now, I have no issues with, with communicating that to the team and, and, and saying, look, we're trying to make as much money as possible to reach this milestone so that whatever we make after that, we can start to plow into things that start to drive us now closer into the original vision. And, and so it's just being clear about communicating why uh, revenues is such an important KPI for your mission. I think that's the key thing, for sure. A quick question on the tech. Um, you know, you've talked about ethical AI. I believe you've built something like 12 algorithms, or maybe you, you've got more since then. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, algorithms like uh, what uh, the one are the ones that are managing a Facebook feed, for instance, which you could argue that contributes to what you're fighting for, right? Which is misinformation, biases, and all that stuff. There's a lot also about literature and research on the biased algorithms or algorithmic biases. Uh, what's what's your take on this? And is this um, this a challenge that you have to deal with uh, as you build uh, the tech? Massively, and and I think one of the one of the challenges for me as an entrepreneur has been trying to hammer that point even since the beginning I started the company. You know, back in 2017, I was talking about how we need to build this ethically and we need to think about who is labeling the data and we need to have efficient systems to track model versioning so that we know that version of that model was built by these annotators and this was the profile of the annotators. And that comes at a cost because that takes more time to build in versus shipping something in two weeks that you need for for a demo or a trial. And so, I guess for us, the way that we have compromised on that slightly is to say, look, is to be very transparent about whatever we ship as being flawed and how it's flawed. Because I know that, that you know, what we've shipped today is not the perfect version of what we want to ship. 
the perfect version of what we want to ship is being able to have a model which explains itself absolutely from who labeled the data, the demographics of who labeled the data, explaining which exact words and phrases within the actual document were, were causing the classification, being able to link to annotators in the right expertise to be able to relabel the data, and that's having that loop in place. Right now, the system is is simply, we've annotated some, some data, we've trained a model, and it works well enough for the customers. And I think that's the thing that, that I remember learning from one of our investors, Sunil Paul, who built Brightmail, which was the first email commercially available email spam algorithm. And I remember him telling me that the first email spam algorithm was operating at about 40% accuracy. But, you know, that became a huge company because it was the best that was out there. Mm -hmm. And so I always now say this is like, you know, when, when customers ask us, you know, what about this? What about that? You know, what about the accuracy of that system? How is it built in that way? We just say like, yes, those are things that we're working on. But if you want to actually go in and, and flag propaganda, and you can compare it to all the other solutions out there, we will be the best. And that's what we strive for. I guess another break that we have is that right now we're not doing full automation and removal. So we flag to our customers what might be propaganda or hate speech, and they ultimately take the decisions with their trust and safety teams or their analysts on whether they think this is real propaganda or not. We're an assistant. Okay. And maybe uh, I just got a more an existentialist or philosophical question for you just, just to build on this. We live in a world where people are questioning science. They're questioning experts. They are questioning what racism is. Uh, what's the definition of, you know, these terms that, you know, maybe in the past, or maybe it's me getting older, but maybe in the past we, we thought we agreed on. Isn't that like a massive challenge for you when, you know, you are basically selling a service that ranks or, uh, you know, what is racism or not? Is this, you know, something that, you know, you've had discussions about or that, you know, a problem that you've encountered? In terms of how we define those things? Yeah, because you could easily say, I mean, some people have said that Google the Google, you know, search algorithm is, you know, biased towards, you know, let's say the Democrats, for instance, you know, some people who disagree with how you score things could, you know, come to the same conclusion. Absolutely. Just, yeah. I think the way that we've solved that is that, A, we're a new company. And so that gives us a huge advantage of thinking about things differently. Mm -hmm. From day one, we wanted to be as transparent and open as possible so that people could actually have a reasoned debate about how our things are built. As an example, on our website today, you can go on try.factmatter.com and try out every single algorithm and any article that you want online. And you can give feedback to what you find. Um, and you can give us, you can write us an email. You can, you know, give us feedback on the scores. We don't retrain the algorithms automatically. We do look at the feedback and we do evaluate that, but it leads to this open dialogue. We, we have a browser extension where you can rate the objectivity of, of every article which we launched today and it became number two on product time, by the way. Oh, congrats. So, congrats. so we launched that, but people are constantly asking, how do you rate the objectivity and how does it work? And so we linked them to the academic paper. We you know, asked them to give feedback on everything that they find and if they don't agree and even write a comment on that. And it's funny that there isn't really a place on the internet where you can have a debate about how an article is written. You can debate about the article and what it's saying, but objectively stripping out what the thing's trying to achieve or what, you know, who it's biased towards or if it's, but actually just saying, how is this framed? Is this the right way to frame this article? There's no place in the internet to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're trying to achieve that training data because we want to think people to look at a article and strip out any emotional biases they might have and say, look, is this the right way to frame the news? And then, yeah. and then, and then start from there. Yeah. So anyway, to go back to your question, we just make things super transparent. You know, we've given our test sets on some of our models to researchers, um, in public forums where they can go in and actually build models on the back of those test sets that we work so hard, you know, and spend money to, to, to build. 
because we value that the, the community knows how we're building stuff. And I think one of the issues of the platforms is they're so, so scared of, obviously they're a public company and they, they have you know, risks of their stock prices going down. But I think an approach of just saying, look, we're actually wrong. We haven't got this stuff figured out. It doesn't work in those situations, but we're working on it, you know, and we're going to shut it down for a bit and, and rethink this. That would have gone such a long way versus kind of saying, we're going to fix it all. We're just hiring hundreds and thousands of engineers. We're going to get this under control. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I uh, want to go back to mistakes. You said you're a first time founder. What are the, you know, top two or three mistakes that you've made that if you could, you know, go back in time would, let's say, tackle differently? I think the thing that I would have tackled differently would have been, I'd say, with the team that I wanted to bring on at the beginning of the company. In the beginning of the company, we actually also had a very unorthodox way of building the company. We had volunteers from around the world helping to build the system. You know, and these are people who some some of them would give sort of two hours of their time a week, some of them would give five hours of their time per week, some of them were sitting in Turkey, some of them were sitting in Brazil, some of them were sitting in India. But what really kept everyone really close together at that point is that they really wanted to work on the solution. They didn't just think, hey, this is a really cool problem or like, I'm an engineer and I'd love to like, try out building this for a few months. It was more like they were really wedded to making this thing work for the long run. And so I think what I would have done differently is, is, is just to focus on that as my main hiring criteria of how badly do you care about this problem? Because when it's going to get tough in the first few years, will you stick around and make it happen? And so I think that would be the first thing, I, uh, my main learning as well. So, so you would focus more on the, the drive and let's say the alignment of, of your hires with the purpose as opposed to, you know, CV qualifications experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And we've had proven many, many times that some of the best employees in the company, best team members I've, I've worked with really didn't have backgrounds that you would think, um, wow, you know, that person's like absolutely perfect fit. And, and the problem is investors like to look at decks and they have their team slide and it's like, you know, this person's ex Google, ex Facebook, they ran this division there. And quite frankly, from my experience, those people tend to be the worst employees, you know, like it's the people who, who really are willing to, to learn and have a growth mindset and can train themselves, um, and want to train with a company that, that end up being you know, your most valuable assets. A any other things that you uh, screwed up? Yeah, um, I'd, say, <laughs> I'd say probably one of the things that, that I I wish I'd sort of done more is, is when we raised our initial round, I kind of didn't really properly scope how much money would be needed to build the business. And so I just pulled out of the hat a million dollars as the, the number. Now, That probably was wrong, right? That, that was wrong because <laughs> we had to raise money after that and we had to keep raising more money after that. And we raised bridge rounds and things like this. How much have, we, have you raised so far? We raised $3.4 million. Okay. But that's come in a million, then 400K, then 500K, then 200, you know. So every yeah. few months, we're kind of having, having to raise and prove more things. So I think being able to just say, look, look, you know, actually go big and, and this is exactly the amount of money that we need to do this properly. And then not even starting until we had that. Um, and not even spending very much money until we figured out you know, exactly how we're going to scale. That would be probably a better strategy. So I guess you spend a lot of time on on, on pitches and investor meetings. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. But you know what it does is that it's not great to spend all of your time as a founder pitching. But I'd say that it does give you a ton of feedback and reality checks all the time as to, hey, you know, you need to, like, you're in competition and to, to raise this money, it's not going to come for free. Like, you, know, you need to hit these milestones and those milestones. And that then creates a sense of intensity and, and momentum in the team. And we're now at this point, sort of three years on, where, where we're launching things. I mentioned this launch today on Product Hunt. And they're going well. You know, we're getting traction. And it's, 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 uh, I'm really seeing a, a point where you know, 
really in the next kind of six months, we're going to see a massive inflection in, in revenues and growth. Um, I think it's a good segue for, for, for the end. What's next, you know, for Fakmata in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? I think the next 12 months is that we, we have a, we have people love our product now, our B2B product. Um, we've shipped it about, and when we launched it, and by the way, that B2B product has seen many different iterations of who we'd sell it to and so on. But now we found big brands, big corporates who have reputation issues and the product exactly solves that problem very well. And so everyone that we pitch to wants to get into a paid trial or start paying for the product. And so, you know, within a month of launching it, we signed our first contract. Um, and, and that's more like a, the, um, uh, you know, media monitoring, media monitoring. Of, of product, yes. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I think our focus is going to be on that, scaling that. And we think we can drive, you know, almost next year, about $3 million of, of ARR in that business. So that'd be very, very rapid growth. And I think the other thing that we, w- we will see in the next 12 to 18 months, because we're in the 10-year plan, we're now on year four, is that we're going to be transitioning to a B2C phase. And so the th- product that we launched today, which is our browser extension that got number two on Product Hunt, is a start of that journey where we start to get consumers looking at the same things that we find for business customers. So, you know, what are the rumors about COVID-19? What are people spreading about Coca-Cola? What are people saying about you know, Black Lives Matter or the opioid crisis, and then giving us feedback on what we find and the algorithms that are flagging propaganda and seeing if they're working or not. And then that then feeding in automatically into enhancing the entire system. Thank you so much for your time. It's been lots of fun, very insightful. And I wish you all the best for the next phase. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. As usual, you can find the show notes at stunena.com. Also, quick reminder, we've launched an online course called Growth Leap. Design your startup for high performance and impact. You can learn more at academy.stunena.com. Thanks a lot and see you soon.